All right, so this, uh, this lesson, we're going to start chapter two as Jesus goes public with His ministry. Uh, first demonstration of His power, first demonstration of His power and authority. Now, until this time in the book of John, until this time, Jesus' ministry is largely practiced among uh, the uh, disciples of John the Baptist. Those are His first disciples. You know, John is pointing to Him his interaction mostly with the disciples of John. There's a kind of an overlapping period there where John's ministry and Jesus' ministry, they, they, they overlap for a, a certain amount of time. Uh, also, uh, his ministry is confined to his home area and family. And isn't that normal when you become a Christian? Uh, isn't, that, isn't that usually the first place you start to minister? You, know, you, you, you share with your wife or your brother or something, you know, your cousins, your, your immediate family, then you work your way out. Same thing with Jesus. His, his public ministry begins in his own you know, uh, geographic area, his own family, and then slowly it, it begins to work its way uh, out. Now there's little, if any, resistance to Jesus at this point. Uh, just as there usually is not too much resistance uh, with our efforts to confess Christ uh, when we, uh, we first become Christians. I remember when I first became a Christian, well, I was anxious, you know, I told my mom, and, I told, and, and the reaction was, well, you know, that's nice. <laughs> Good for you, you know, that's kind of, kind of what it was like. Uh, and we don't usually get a whole lot of resistance uh, if we share our faith with people in, inside the church building in our own Christian family. And we're not supposed to anyways. It's when we reveal ourselves publicly that the trouble starts and so it was with Jesus when He starts His public ministry in Cana. So uh, we're uh, at a wedding feast uh, and um, uh, wedding feasts were great and joyous occasions uh, during, the, uh, during that particular time. Uh, life revolved around the religious calendar, around family events. So uh, the first public demonstration of His power begins at a family event, the wedding at, uh, at Cana. So let's talk a little bit about weddings in this time, at this time. A, uh, a betrothal, today we call it an engagement, meant that the couple were legally joined as man and wife, but usually they remained with their own families until cohabitation was arranged. And so there was the idea of the dowry, you know, the dowry had to be fixed and the you know, family things, the fathers, uh, dealt with each other, and that took time. I think I mentioned to you once that in our congregation back in Montreal, we had um, uh, members of the church who uh, came from Africa, and um, uh, one brother told me that, uh, yes, it took several years, as a matter of fact, to arrange the dowry. There was a lot of bargaining going on between his family and his wife's family to, you know, to get the right amount. So uh, this was uh, usual in those times as well. The wedding feast signaled that the couple would begin actually living together as husband and wife. There was no ceremony. You know, the apostles didn't serve as ministers you know, for marriage. That's something that came much, much, much later as a tradition. But in Jewish culture, there was no, they have a ceremony today, but there was no ceremony then. The betrothal, the arrangement to marry between the families, the contract that was agreed upon, that, that was pretty much what made you legally married. As a matter of fact, you needed to get a divorce, a legal divorce to break the betrothment, the betrothal rather, even if you hadn't lived together. That was the case, wasn't it, with Joseph and Mary, right? They hadn't lived together, obviously. And when Joseph found out that Mary uh, was pregnant, what was his first reaction? Well, he, he was going to divorce her quietly. So that was uh, also part of that culture. A lot of times the groom and his party would parade through the streets in order to fetch his bride. 
bring her to the wedding feast, from which they would eventually leave to spend their first night together in their, in their home. And uh, we've seen this, and we see this in Europe, in small villages. You know, if you've been to Europe, you, you see that in small villages. There's a, parade, a wedding parade going through, and people singing and dancing and playing instruments, you know, and the bride and the groom making their way to, the, uh, uh, to where the uh, wedding uh, reception will be. So this was the, uh, this was the pattern. The feast itself could be an elaborate event which lasted you know, a week, seven days or more as guests arrived, you know, uh, and the couple as well. Uh, sometimes we find that difficult to believe. Man, they sat at the table and they ate for seven days. You know? <laughs> Think about Thanksgiving. Think about Thanksgiving in large families. Does the celebration only happen when you start cutting the turkey? Well, no. You know, well, Grandma's coming in on Friday, and then Uncle Joe's coming in from Vermont on Saturday morning, and I think his relatives will show up Sunday. And, you know, and in the meantime, you're cooking for this one and getting that one ready and doing airport runs. And, well, when they say seven days, you know, by the time the families finally arrived at the wedding feast, you know, it took some time. And then those who had come and had been there a couple of days, and so, well, they left right after. Those who, you know, who arrived pretty much on that day stayed a few days longer. So it was a long, they didn't sit at the table for seven days, but the, the festival, the happiness, the family reunion, if you wish, uh, would last several days. And of course, this type of celebration required an ample supply of food and drink, just like think about Thanksgiving, right? The fridge is packed with stuff, the fridge in the garage is packed with stuff. Same idea, same, same thing. So it was at such a feast that Jesus was invited along with His disciples at Cana. So we read in verse one to three, John chapter two, verses one to three, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there and both Jesus and disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And so um, Cana was in Galilee, near Jesus' adult home. Jesus, as an adult, he lived somewhere. He lived in the fishing village of Capernaum that we see there, Cana to the east of that. Uh, Mary was at the wedding as a friend and as a helper. So we, we see between the lines that it could have been someone from her family that was being married because she, she wasn't just a guest. She was actually a helper. She was helping in the presentation. Again, I come back to my Thanksgiving analogy. You know, some, people, some guests just show up, they sit, they're served, they sit at the table, right? But you know, your mother's sister and your and her mother, you know, they're the ones who are in the kitchen and getting things organized. So same thing here. Mary is there. She's there as a, as a helper. And the wine ran out early, and in losing the main beverage so soon would spoil the feast, the meal, embarrass the family. Uh, so Mary comes to Jesus rather than to the host um, and uh, states there's a problem, and in so doing, intimates that he should, you know, he should do something. Uh, he should do something about it. And it's interesting what his reply is in verse four and five. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. Now, that this term, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not come, literally means never mind. He wasn't being insulting or impolite to his earthly mother. It just meant, don't worry about that. Never mind that. It means, this is, this is my affair, not, not your affair, your worry. Uh, another translation, uh, what common thing do we share in, in this? So, in her question contains a suggestion that, he, that she expects her action to move him to some sort of solution. 
You know, she's putting pressure on him. And he's replying to her, you don't have to put pressure on me. I know what's happening. You know, this, is, this isn't your thing. You don't have to worry about it. And so his answer reveals that he's aware of what is going on and he's in control of the situation. He doesn't act because of her insistence. You know, Jesus said what about the things that he did? Who motivated him to do the things that he did? Yeah, the Father, right? He said, I, I don't do anything unless the Father tells me to do those things. So it's not because of his mother that he's going to perhaps do something. We find out a little later on that it's a miracle. He doesn't do miracles at the insistence of other people. He doesn't heal people because his apostles come to him and say, you know what, this guy, he's a good guy. I mean, I know there are a lot of lepers, but this particular leper, he's, just, he's one of our buddies. You think you could do something for him? You know, Jesus didn't, you know, that, that was not his motivation. He says his time has not yet come. God initiates his actions, not man. Note also that the term woman is not a harsh or derogatory term for that time. In John 19, 26, what does he say to, uh, uh, to John? You know, woman, or to John and Mary, woman, behold your son. Woman, behold your son. In, in mentioning the idea that you know, John will now take care of her. Again, not a derogatory term. A little bit like it would be in, if we said to our own, our own mother, woman, you know, if I would have said that to my mother, there would have been broken dishes, you know. <laughs> she didn't like that. So his mother understands his response and since she was there as a helper, she gives instructions to the other helpers to follow his directions. I want you to notice that she leaves the problem in his hands after stating it. And I think that there's a, you know, a little lesson there for us as well. A lot of times we add solutions along with our prayers. You ever notice that? <laughs> you know, we pray to God about something, I don't know what it is, it could be you know, a million things. And along with our prayer, we offer up the solution. And that's okay, I mean, you know, we, if somebody is sick, for example, when I pray for them, I always pray for them to have life or to be better. You know, I don't ever pray for somebody to die or, you know. But we need to realize that God's solution to our prayers are not always the same as our solutions. Sometimes, yes, and we can rejoice for that, but not always. And we have to be mature enough to kind of respect that. So we go to verses six, uh, seven, and eight. It says, uh, now there were six stone water putts set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill up the water pots with water, so they filled uh, they filled them up to the brim and he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. So water pots needed for purification as well as the washing of utensils. That was the custom of the Jews. They washed everything first, washed their hands. So they needed a lot of water. Didn't have obviously running water in those days. And Jesus has them filled with water and then a sample of that taken to the host uh, nowadays we have an MC, you know, the guy with the microphone and he spins records and he says, now ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so and you know, the wedding organizer, wedding MC, well they had somewhat of a same type thing in those days, managed the wedding feast. And I want you to notice how effortlessly the miracle is produced. Jesus only intentioned it and it was done. No mumbo jumbo, no jumping around, no calling on the stars in the sky, nothing. He just said, just fill them up with water and okay, take a ladle, bring them a sample, a cup. Let's see the reaction. So when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. 
So when the host or the head waiter tastes, he compliments the groom on the excellency of the wine. Now, a side benefit of the miracle is that it not only saved the family from embarrassment and maintained the joy of the feast, it also blessed the groom in the eyes of his guests. Everybody was happy to be there to begin with, but because of the miracle, the groom is you know, elevated. He's edified in front of his family and his guests. Now the head waiter's compliment rested on the common practice of serving the sweet wine, in other words, the fresh wine first, and after a lot of eating and drinking, the taste buds are dulled, then they would serve the older, less tasty wine, which would by that time not be noticed. So the groom was complimented on serving good wine at the beginning and then the best at the end. And there are a couple of comments I'd like to make about the first miracle of Jesus at Cana. First of all, that he, you know, certainly that he did it at a wedding. You know, blesses the institution of marriage. That it is, a primar it is of primary importance, you know, especially in this day and age where the basic institution of marriage is being attacked from so many from so many sides, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but we know, we read the papers, we see what's happening. More children being born to single mothers than to married couples in our society. Uh, you know, the, the push to legalize gay marriage, so on and so forth, you know, people being separated. Uh, so it's significant that Jesus chooses a wedding setting in order to perform His first miracle. Marriage and it, uh, its uh, institution is highly, highly honored by Jesus. Uh, first of all, let's um, think about the secretiveness of it. I don't know about you, but if it was me and I had these miraculous powers and it was time to launch them, boy, I tell you, <laughs> I'd make it spectacular, you know? Like a big entrance, you know, like show business. People come out, you know, uh, well, we went to a hockey game. Let's talk about the hockey game. You know, the hockey, the hockey players come out on the ice, you know, and there's lights and sirens and you know, fireworks, you know, a big entrance. Jesus makes His entrance. He's the Son of God and it's all quiet. It's secretive. Only a few people know about it. His mother, a few of the servants knew that a tremendous miracle had taken place along with His disciples. So the beauty of this is Jesus manages to demonstrate His power to a few people without upsetting or overshadowing the happy moment that this couple and guests were sharing. Talk about love. Talk about diplomacy. I mean, imagine if everybody knew about the miracle at the wedding, what would have happened? Everybody forgot about the bride and the groom, are you kidding me? So the miracle would be spoken of for all time, but for that precious moment, Jesus limited its impact to accommodate His hosts while providing a witness for His disciples. To me, you know, that, that just shows delicacy, kindness, graciousness. He thought of the couple and their happiness. It was their moment. Imagine the Son of God <laughs> kind of you know, quietly steps into His position and, and, and doesn't upset the moment of happiness that these two people are having. This, this is the kind of Lord that we have. Uh, another point that I'd like to make about this is the nature of it, the nature of the miracle itself. The basic nature of, uh, of the miracle is that Jesus transforms water into wine with only His will. Now there's a debate here that goes on. A lot of people debate whether the water turned into you know, pure grape juice or wine with some alcohol content. 
And you know, I've read a lot about this uh, debate, uh, both sides of it. The argument, of course, is based on the Greek word oinos. And if it only refers to fermented wine, or does it refer to grape juice, or does it refer to both at the same, at the same time? And uh, I've, I've uh, provided you, or I will provide you with arguments for both sides of this issue. I've got them here, I've got a stack here. So I did some research and I tried to find, what's the, I, I really tried to find a great argument uh, for the idea that what Jesus produced was purely grape juice. And then I found an argument you know, that supports the idea that oinos means wine. Now the content, of course, was it 2%, 3%, 9%, 12%, you know, that's, again, that's a whole other argument. And then I found a, an, a, a debate, somebody published a debate which I've printed out and I've made copies for all of you here, which, which is really great because it's on the same piece of paper. The same question, the same you know, debate items answered from both perspectives on the same piece of paper, which I think is you know, healthy. Um, you'll be able to read it. You'll be able to decide for yourself. Perhaps you're undecided. Perhaps you're one side, the other side of this debate. For those of you watching uh, online, you can get the transcript of this lesson as well as the notes, of course, by going to our website, teaching website, BibleTalk.tv and searching lesson four of this uh, particular uh, Gospel of John and you'll find all the printed material that you can download and print off for your own study. Now, for our study, I simply want to point out that whether it was grape juice or wine with 2% alcohol in it or 6%, whatever it was, I want you to keep your eye on the ball. The important thing to remember was that this was a great miracle. A lot of people go to this particular passage in order to debate the quote wine issue. And usually the question is framed, is it a sin to uh, you know, drink uh, wine? And that's fine. You can use this passage among others in Proverbs and in the New Testament to debate that issue for one side or another. But I want you to understand that that's not why that passage is there. That passage is not there as a proof text for that debate. You can use it for that, but that would only be a secondary use. The primary use of this passage here is to demonstrate Jesus' first miracle. The God-man steps forward and produces this miracle. And so, in verse 11, John says, this is the beginning of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So uh, John notes that this is his first sign. Now the Greek word for a miracle is sign, it, it can be translated into the English word sign. Uh, a sign, uh, the point is that a miracle is not done to amaze, but rather to point to someone. That's why the, the word in the Greek actually means a, to point, to sign, to point out, or to reveal something. In this case, the sign points to Jesus as someone with supernatural power. I mean, had you been a disciple at that wedding, or if you were a guest at that, well, maybe the guest would have, would, would have not known, but if you would have been one of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the ones who went and put the water in and then you, you went back and took a scoop to bring to the, if you were that servant, what would you be asking yourself? What, you, what would you be saying to yourself? You'd say, who is this? Who is this person? You know, you'd go home and you'd say to your wife, You'll, you'll never guess what happened. <laughs> and she would say, well, what happened? And you say, well, I poured, you know, we had six jars and they were full of water and then all of a sudden they, they were wine. 
And she said, well, really? And who was it? Well, Jesus, son of Joseph, you know, he lives in Capernaum. And some of his disciples were there. Well, that's amazing. And you know what? I, th I think he's speaking in the synagogue Saturday. Well, let's go and hear. You know, the Bible doesn't kind of write all that in between stuff there. And what do you think the disciples thought when they were witness of that miracle? I mean, they would be looking at each other going, oh my, what have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> you know, they're following this person thinking, well, we think he's the Messiah. You know, the, as a Jew, they're thinking he's the Messiah. You know, he's going to be a great prophet. He's going to be you know, like one of the prophets of old, Ezekiel, you know, somebody I, you know, somebody to lead us, you know, and, and we're along for the ride. They were not expecting this. You know, we're like in the twilight zone now, huh? What is happening? And I don't think there was shouting. I don't know about you, but when I, when I see something spectacular, usually I go, and I just like, I got nothing to say. What's that word, dumbfounded? Old fashioned word, we don't use it much now, but it just means you're, you're speechless. So John mentions that these disciples believed in him because of this sign. And that is a brief show, remember? So here we have two strands, remember I said, Three strands, one, Jesus demonstrating that He's the God-man with His teaching and miracles. First strand of narrative. Second strand of narrative, the reaction that some have of belief. Third strand of narrative, the reaction that some have of disbelief. So in this short passage, we see Jesus demonstrating Himself as being the God-man, the miracle maker, and here, in this you know, description that John gives, we also see belief. The disciples believe in Him. Now, their belief was not like a, a straight trajectory, was it? They started believing at Cana and continued to believe and were stronger in their belief and really strong and strong and got better. And I think I'll stop right there. That's not how their belief went. How did it go? They believed, they didn't believe. They believed, they didn't believe. They believed, they were afraid. They believed, they, they abandoned him. When he really needed them, they didn't believe. Does that sound familiar? Well, it sounds like me. I believe, I'm strong, I can do it. I'm no good, I'm not worthy. Whoops, I do believe, yes, yes. And then I remember, oh, remember what I did back in 74, zoom, back down again. <laughs> That's how our faith goes, up and down and up and down. And, and so if our faith goes like that and we're 2,000 years removed, imagine they were right with Him and their faith was going up and down and up and down. And they were right next to Him. So we, we shouldn't be surprised when that happens to us as well. That's my, that's my point here. So verse 12, we'll finish out this passage here. I think we're going to stop here. It says, after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Why Capernaum? That's where he lived. So we see from this verse that the feast was probably a family affair because even Jesus' brothers were at the event. But were they privy to the miracle? Nope. You know, a prophet, is not with honor, a prophet is not without honor except where? In his own home. So the disciples saw it. A servant that he didn't even know saw the miracle, but his brothers that he lived with, they were not subject to it. His mother, yes. His brothers, we don't think so. So Jesus returns to his home, which was in Capernaum. And one thing, it's interesting, some scholars, some you know, researchers uh, believe that uh, Jesus lived with Peter. 
because Peter lived in Capernaum as well. So uh, uh, if that's not the case, certainly they, it was a small village, they lived there together. I visited that place, Capernaum, archeologists have found it and so on and so forth. Visited the synagogue, you know, every little town had a synagogue. Visited that particular synagogue from the first century. They don't have the walls or anything, but they do have the, uh, the outline of the floor and some of the walls you know, that they've excavated down to, and um, the entrance. And what's interesting is if you go there, you can walk through the, like there's, it's like a low wall, it's like a retaining wall if you wish, you know, small now, but you can walk through the entrance of the synagogue at Capernaum and know that that's the same entrance that Jesus walk through. It's kind of amazing. I mean, it's just, you know, but it's still pretty amazing. All right, well that's our lesson for this morning. I, I'm going to cut it a little short this morning because the next section is a big section and I didn't want to rush through the next section that we have. So that's it. Uh, we'll see, uh, those of you who are watching online, we'll see you uh, next time uh, for lesson five. Um, and that'll be cleansing the temple. So I have lots of information about the temple and what it looked like and so on and so forth. So be here for that.